<laughs> Take two. <laughs> Y'all will never see the first one because I, I sat here and did a, about an hour video and never turned my microphone on. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, I've got, got to redo it. And uh, what I'm wanting to do is uh, make a couple videos to kind of get up to speed on some things that we've missed over the last couple weeks. And uh, my intention, and I'm just going to have to do it. I know I jump all over the place sometimes. And, and the reason for that is I'm wanting to teach through both programs. I'm wanting to teach Romans through Philemon and Hebrews through Revelation. But when you're in charge of a local congregation, some things come up. Some people may be lacking in some things. And so issues come up where i got to break away from the program and, and teach on some different subjects and things of that nature. And so I guess the best way to do it is for me to come over here and make some videos by myself. Uh, still teach some of them during Sunday, and eventually we'll get through it. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to sit down one day this week and organize these things in the playlists, Romans, Hebrews, and, and things of that nature. Try to get a little more organized uh, with it. I've never been a, a very organized person to begin with. And another problem I have is that I, as I'm studying the Bible, everything I learn I want to teach. And so it gets me thrown all over the place. If I see something that's really helped me or, or something I've never seen before, I want to teach it. And there's just not enough time to teach everything I learn. And that, that's why some of you are going to have to understand, too, that you can't be dependent upon men all the time. Uh, one of the things I love about Brother David Osteen is when he writes books, he, he keeps them very simple, very general. And really, they're, they're, they, are more you, they are more to give you uh, necessary tools to study the Bible for yourself, which is crucial. Uh, man lives by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And tools to help you study the Bible for yourself is, is, is an amazing thing. But when God gave you 66 books of the Bible, you shouldn't spend all your time reading other men's books. Now, they can be helpful. They can be useful. But there's enough material in this book to keep you busy for a lifetime. And so the important thing is to get you in a position where you can understand these things for yourself and study them for yourself. Because we, we will never be able to give you all the things that we learn out of the Bible, there's just, it's just not possible. We don't have that kind of time. Uh, but what we've been looking at here for a couple of lessons now is we've been looking at Hebrews to Revelation. And we've been looking at how Hebrews to Revelation and their doctrinal application, the content of these epistles, have a doctrinal application to Israel in the last days that's been determined upon them and upon Jerusalem. Uh, when you read Hebrews 4, 1, he says, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Now that, that phrase there, his rest, I ain't going to write it up there. People have this very generic way of reading the Bible, and I'm not being mean. We were all like this when we, when we were babes, but at some point in time you got to grow up in the Lord and, and receive a mind that, under, that can communicate with your father. Uh, you have to understand how, how, your, how your God talks. And you've got to understand what he's saying. Uh, you've got to develop a mind where you can actually communicate with, with God the Father. And quit being this baby in understanding. Uh, people have this generic way of reading the Bible. They read that phrase, his rest. And to them it means going to heaven when you die. But his rest is very specific. Because what we're talking about is, is the time determined upon Israel and Jerusalem. Now in Psalm 132, verses 11 through 14, God clearly identifies what His rest is. A promise being left us of entering into His rest. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was a verse in the Bible that said, This is my rest. Well, there is. It's Psalm 132. You read verses 11 through 14, and you'll learn really, real quickly that what God's rest is, is when His Son returns and sets upon the throne of David and builds God a house there on Mount Zion. 
That is God's rest. And it has to do with the, with the millennial reign when Christ returns to the earth and God establishes his kingdom, establishes his throne, and then he as the seed of David builds God a house. This was all uh, uh, promised in the Old Testament scriptures. But what we, what we are looking at is how Hebrews through Revelation have a doctrinal application to the nation of Israel and to Jerusalem in the final time period determined upon them that's already been prophesied in the book of Daniel. And these books apply to a period of time after our present dispensation is fulfilled when the things in Romans through Philemon and all that God has made known in those epistles of what he's doing at this present time when those things are, fulfill, are fulfilled and the new man that God is now creating in Christ, seated in heavenly places, when that new man is complete and received up unto glory in the rapture, then the final seven years determined upon the nation of Israel is going to be fulfilled and, 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 and uh, 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 the final seven years are going to be fulfilled and then Christ will return to the earth to set up his kingdom. And so you got to understand the Bible revelation. You have the nations, and I'm going to be quick about this. And God divided the earth up to those nations in Genesis chapter 10. All those nations received an inheritance in the earth. He divided the earth up among the sons of Noah for an inheritance. But then he calls a man out of here by Abraham and promises that man Abraham a specific piece of land and says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And this land that I've shown you, I'm going to give to your seed for an, for, for an everlasting inheritance. Now he calls Moses out. Moses goes down and calls Abraham's seed, that nation out of Egypt. And then God gives that people a law to not make them a great nation. They were already a great nation. He, call, he gives them a law now to make that people a holy nation. And to, to live in that land promised to Abraham, they have to be a holy people. Because that is a holy land. Because God has chosen that land to be his holy habitation. That's Exodus chapter 15. And now God tells that people... That if they don't obey this law, he's going to curse them and punish them and even kick them back out of the land. But no matter what, he would never forget the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob back there. And so when you read Leviticus 26, very important chapter, God discusses the punishments he's going to bring upon Israel for disobeying his law. And the final punishment that he's going to bring upon them is he's going to kick them out of that land and scatter them among the heathen nations, which is what he done uh, uh, first with Assyria here. I ain't going. Well, you know the kingdom was divided and northern tribes go into captivity there. Judah and Benjamin are taken captive there, and these were by the Assyrian, and I ain't really wanting to get too detailed on this. And Babylon. The Assyrian and Babylonian kingdom. Now the reason God kicked them out of that land is for violating that law contract. But his promises to Abraham are still good. The law cannot disannul these promises. And so God tells them in Leviticus that when he scatters them among these nations, if they will confess their iniquity and accept this punishment that he would remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he would remember the land. And so while Daniel was down here in Babylon, God told Jeremiah they were going to be in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, and then they would return. And that God would, would fulfill his, his good word toward them and giving them an expected end. God already has a determined end for the nation of Israel. He has an expected end for them. And so Daniel down here now, reading the book of Jeremiah, knows that these 70 years are coming to an end. He understands that they're in captivity for violation of the law. 
and that God brought upon him all the curses that were written in the books of Moses. And, and so he understands now that according to what was written in the law of Moses, that if they would confess their iniquity and accept the punishment that God gave them, that, that he, would, he would remember this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what's Daniel do? He begins to pray and confess the iniquity of Israel, to confess their sin. And God to shows Daniel here that there are actually, there's actually more than 70 years determined upon Israel. He says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, thy holy city. Now, folks, you, some, some of you got good sense, man. There's something about the Bible that when people pick it up, they just lose their, their minds. You know who Daniel's people are, and you know what the holy city is. And then you come to a book of Romans written to all that be in Rome, and you don't see the difference. Rome is not Jerusalem. Neither is Corinth or Ephesus or Thessalonia or any of those places. The Romans are not Daniel's people. The Ephesians are not Daniel's people. And you better get this stuff straightened out. I mean that. This time period here is, is a is a set time determined upon God in his dealings with Abraham's seed, who he chose to be that great nation and that holy city that God has chosen to be his holy habitation. Here will I dwell. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell forever. God hath chosen Zion. It is his holy habitation. And God has a set time determined in prophecy upon those people. Now, he divides that time into three periods. These 70 weeks, seven weeks, which is 49 years, seven sevens. This is for rebuilding. They return. They rebuild the city. They rebuild the wall. They rebuild the temple. And then God says 62 weeks or 434 years unto the Messiah, the Prince, right there. He already came. You see, if a Jew would read that book, he wouldn't fall into the trap that's coming in the 70th week of Daniel. There's a trap coming. God is going to prove that people. He warned them about it in Deuteronomy 13. I ain't got time to go and, and go into that stuff. You read Deuteronomy 13 for yourself and see that God has already warned this people that he's going to prove them with a false prophet one day. That false prophet shows up in Revelation 13. Why wouldn't he? Deuteronomy 13, Revelation 13. Read it sometime. But the Messiah come, and he comes off the Mount of Olives upon a colt, the fall of an ass, in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9. Thy king cometh, riding lowly upon a colt, the fall of an ass. And he enters the temple, and he drives people out, and said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And he spends a couple of days in that temple teaching and healing. And on the last day there, he stands up and he begins to preach against the rulers of Jerusalem. And he calls them blind, hypocrites, and fools because they didn't know the hour of their visitation. And he leaves that place and says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That temple is not his house. It's their house. It belongs to the vain religious system of the nation of Israel. And he said that house is left desolate. That's going to get them in trouble. And it's going to help you understand what the book of Hebrews is about. Now, they took that man and nailed him to a cross there. Now, after 69 weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. That's 62 and 7. Now, how much time is left determined upon God's people, and upon that holy city, Jerusalem. There's one week left, and that's where you pick up with in the book of Acts here. The ministry, we'll draw it out here. You have the ministry of the 12 apostles beginning here. Now, we're going to get into Hebrews. I'm, I'm going to have to do this in two parts. 
I want to emphasize this stuff. When you get to the ascension of Jesus Christ, they have all kinds of information. They have all kinds of information that's been given to them. Here, what was spoken in time past by the prophets, they have all kinds of information that's been given to them in their prophetic scriptures. And what they know, what God has revealed up to this point, is that after the ascension of Christ, there's only one week left. Seven years are left determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's what they know. And in Acts 3.21, Peter says this. You know what Peter don't have in Acts chapter 3? He don't have Romans through Philemon. What Peter has is the preaching of Jesus Christ by the scriptures of the prophets. That's all he knows. He has no idea that between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel was going to be 2,000 years. You have to explain what the last 2,000 years were about. It can't be about this people or about that city. Because only seven years were left determined upon them. So what's the last 2,000 years been about? Now look at what Peter says in Acts 3.21. Whom the heaven must receive. That's where he went. Christ went up here to the heaven. And he says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of of all his holy prophets since the world began back here. The prophets were foretelling of a time of restitution of all things. And these things have been spoken since the world began. That's what Peter knows. Peter knows that there's seven years left. And then Christ is going to return from heaven and begin the times of restitution. However, in Acts chapter 9, another apostle is called... By Jesus Christ from heaven. That, that return from heaven that he makes in Acts 9 didn't begin the times of restitution. He returned from heaven and made an unprophesied return to the earth and appeared to a man named Saul of Tarsus here. And we'll, we'll put the fall of Israel right here in Acts chapter 7. And then Paul receives revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the present time. He's getting ready to get information that God didn't show Daniel back here. What God showed Daniel was about Israel and about the holy city. Paul's getting ready to receive a dispensation of God for us Gentiles. It's not about this. That's why it's called Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. There's a portion in that Bible dispensed to us through that apostle and it's for us Gentiles that is isolated and separate from that time. Now people say you think only Gentiles are saved today. No, I believe, I believe Israel saved today through this same mercy God is showing us because when Israel fell, God concluded the whole world in unbelief. There was no difference between Jew and Gentile. He reckoned them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. God is preaching to Israel today the very same message of grace that he's preaching to us Gentiles. Jews are saved today the same way that we are. Look in Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So since the world began, you had what was spoken, what was kept secret. Now, you got to get this. Prior to Paul, what had been kept secret by God had not been made known. And so when when these 12 apostles are preaching here, they're preaching according to what God had spoken. And all they knew was that seven years were left determined upon Israel and upon Jerusalem. And then Christ was going to return and set up the kingdom. Well, that was 2,000 years ago. What happened? 
Well, what happened was God made known something that he had kept secret since the world began. And so when you read Romans 16, you have to understand that there, there is a message about Jesus Christ. Part of it had been spoken by the prophets. Part of it had been kept secret. But you don't understand the full preaching of Jesus Christ just by the mystery. And you don't understand the full preaching of Christ by the prophets. You understand the full preaching of Jesus Christ by the revelation of the mystery and by the scriptures of the prophets. Look at what Paul said in Ephesians 3. Ephesians chapter 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The mystery of who? Of Christ. Ephesians 6, 19, he says. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. Or, or, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel. So the gospel... The gospel is what God has made known concerning his son. Now, part of that gospel was made known by the scriptures of the prophets. Part of that gospel had been kept a secret. But now Paul is making known the mystery of that gospel and the mystery of Christ. Look at what he says in Colossians 1.25. So Paul is simply making known what God had kept secret. Whereof I am made a minister, Colossians 1.25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So this mystery, well, he tells you in the next verse, I better read that. Next verse, he says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So this mystery of Christ this mystery of the gospel in other ages had not been made known, but now it is revealed and this mystery fulfills the word of God. It brought the word of God into completion. There were things God had spoken and things which he had kept secret. Well, if God had never revealed that secret, you wouldn't have the complete revelation of God. And so without Romans through Philemon, you only got part of the picture. Paul's dispensation is very necessary. Without it, you wouldn't understand what's going on in the time period between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel. The prophetic scriptures revealed 70 weeks left determined. Well, 69 of them came and gone. And I promise you, it's been more than seven years since the Messiah was cut off. And so you wouldn't understand what God is doing at this present time without the revelation of this mystery here. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known. By Paul, the preaching might be fully known. If there is no revelation of the secret and all you have is what God had spoken in time past by the prophets up to this point, without Paul's revelation, the preaching is not fully known. What preaching? The preaching of Jesus Christ. You see, the preaching of Jesus Christ is not just in the mystery. We have the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret, and by the scriptures of the prophets, spoken since the world began. The preaching of Jesus Christ has now been made fully known. And it's contained. That's not the full preaching of Christ. That's not the full preaching of Christ. Both of them 
together is the full preaching of Jesus Christ. And it was Paul who made known the mystery and made known what God had kept secret so that by him now the preaching is fully known. And the problem with Christians is, and, and people today is they, don't, they, try to, they try to mix all this together and, or they try to hijack portions here and hijack portions there instead of reading it and getting the full preaching and revelation of God concerning his son. Now what we learn in Paul's mystery dispensation is that while Jesus Christ, remember Peter said, whom heaven must receive. Well, what Paul revealed is that while Christ is in heaven, before his return at the times of restitution, that God seated him up there and made him the head of a new man. And that what God is doing in this present dispensation is making Jew and Gentile, taking Jew and Gentile, reconciling them in one body, and taking of these two and making one new man. And that new man is being created to be the fullness of Jesus Christ in the heavenly places. This new man up here is his fullness. That's the fullness of Christ. Is the new man that God is making. And God has given him this body to be his fullness to feel all things in the heavenly places. So when this new man is completed and fulfilled and the fullness of this mystery runs its course, the dead in Christ and those who are alive and remain, the complete new man is being called up to meet the Lord in the air and go up here to become his fullness in the heavenly realm. That's what God is doing at this present time, not this. I hope you get it. I hope you get it. It'll help you understand your Bible, right? And so, once the new man is complete, it's going up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, you can only learn the mystery of Christ in Paul's epistles. In other ages, it was not made known. Paul said that he's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Meaning, without Paul's preaching, these riches... Here are unsearchable. You couldn't search them in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. We're not saying that that's not the word of God. We're saying that these things were kept secret and therefore they're unsearchable until Paul preaches them. And so you're only going to learn about the mystery of Christ in Romans through Philemon. That's clear. However, God wants us, Paul tells us, that by making known this mystery, he not only wants us to understand the mystery, but to see the fellowship of it. The fellowship of the mystery, which God hath kept secret since the beginning. Which God hath kept hid since, since the beginning, who created all things by Christ Jesus. God wants us to understand the fellowship of the mystery to what he has spoken so that we can understand the full preaching of Jesus Christ. He wants us to understand the eternal purpose. And so, and so by knowing what God has now revealed, what he had kept secret but now made manifest, and by what he spoke since the world began, the preaching of Jesus Christ is now fully known, and we can understand that what God is doing at this present time with the new man in heaven, what he's going to do at the return of his son here at the second coming for the restitution of all things, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, after that thousand years, there is going to be new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth what? Righteousness. That's what God is doing. Is reconciling all things in heaven and all things in the earth. And then he's going to gather both in one in that perfect eternal kingdom out there wherein dwelleth righteousness. So now, when the dispensation of our program is over, there's still one week left in Israel's program. 
Now this is beautifully broken down for you in the book of Daniel, Revelation, even in Zechariah, that in the midst of this week, you're going to have three and a half years, three and a half years, right? Now when you come to the book of Hebrews, something interesting shows up. There's a period out there called today. Now it's not your today, and we'll see that when we get to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 as we look at this internal evidence. But he said, today if you, if you will hear his voice. So there is a limited, there is a certain limited day out here in which God is going to preach to the nation of Israel just like he did back here through Moses. And that message to them is about entering his rest. And he says, if, if today you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as your father's, whom I swear in my wrath. And so there's a day in which God is going to speak to them and tell them to hear His voice. And if they harden their hearts, He's going to swear in His wrath that they shall not enter His rest. That's how that thing goes. Isn't that King James Bible just beautiful? Ain't you glad we don't have to sit up here and make it up and spiritualize things? I just gave you the whole thing in about 30 minutes. I told you what today is, how he's going to swear in his wrath if they shall enter into his rest. He, he breaks down this final week determined upon Israel. There's going to be a period of time in that week in which he speaks to them and calls them and, 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 and preaches to them this gospel of entering into his rest. And if they will not heed it and harden their hearts, he's going to swear in his wrath they shall not enter into his rest. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's a, to see the Bible come together and to understand the great eternal purpose of God in, in time, over thousands of years, it's, it's, I'm, I'm so thankful for it. I'm, I'm so thankful to be where I'm at. And I, I just want to share these things with you so that you can understand it. And so when we come to Hebrews to Revelation, it is obvious, it is obvious that you are picking up at the end of the fullness of this mystery. And the body of Christ that's been created during this period of time has been called up to meet the Lord in the air to receive an inheritance according to the purpose of Him. That worketh all things. We know what that purpose is. It's the gathering of all things in heaven and earth. And we've received an inheritance according to that purpose. And that inheritance deals with the heavenly realm. We're called up to become his fullness to feel that heavenly inheritance that's been given to Jesus Christ. And after the fullness of that program, Hebrews to Revelation is now picking up back with the prophetic scriptures in which God is going to fulfill... That final seven years that was determined upon Israel and Jerusalem. This is obvious, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Well, if you're dealing with what was spoken in time past, then you're not dealing with what was kept secret. That's obvious. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's Jesus Christ and what he spoke to the nation of Israel. The mystery was not made known here. All these people trying to read the body of Christ and Gentile salvation and all this stuff back into here. We're not, we're, I mean, we know the Gentiles are going to be saved through this program. We're talking about this program here of Jew and Gentile made one new man and one body. This stuff is not revealed here. And then it's confirmed, Hebrews 2, 3... It's confirmed by those that heard him. That's the 12 apostles. That's not the apostle Paul. You got to get that. The apostle Paul was not called to simply confirm what the 12 apostles were already doing. He wasn't sent to confirm what Christ spoke from the earth. He's not sent to confirm what was spoken by the prophets. He's not sent to confirm what these 12 apostles are confirming. The apostle Paul is called to make known what God had kept secret since the world began. He's got a completely different ministry to a completely different set of people and group of people. And he penned books, Romans, uh, Corinthians, and all those books 
for this dispensation of Gentile grace to us. And so right now, one of the things you've got to understand is that Christ went back to heaven and in the prophetic program, they're looking for his return to the earth. And you're going to see that as a major theme in Hebrews to Revelation. In this one, we're looking for him to come and gather us unto himself. Those are two different things. Once you get past this event here and you're living here, you're no longer looking for that. You're looking for this, which is exactly what Hebrews to Revelation is teaching. And now I'm going to make one point here, then I'm going to stop the camera, and we'll make, uh, we'll make a second video real quick, because there's a lot of things that I want to talk about in the first chapter of Hebrews, but what, where we're going right now, this is a reintroduction to this stuff, and where we're going now is we're going to take the book of Hebrews, I've already showed you the doctrinal design behind Hebrews through Revelation, and how they progressively build the, the believer up in order to endure this period here and what we're looking at what we're going to be looking at we've already did one video on this but we're going to be looking at the internal evidence in the book of hebrews that if you understand what's actually said in hebrews instead of just using it for your own uh your own doctrinal pet peeves on if what you're saying willfully you try to use that verse to prove everybody in the world's lost but you and, and all this stuff, if you actually read what Hebrews says, you'll see what it's clearly teaching, what period of time it applies to, and to what people it apply to. Uh, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2 couldn't be any clearer. You're dealing with what God has spoken to the nation of Israel through the prophets and his son and what was confirmed to them by the 12 apostles. You're not dealing with what Paul was sent to make known. And, and this is clear. You come Romans through Philemon. The mystery program has ran its course. The body of Christ has been called up. And now God is now speaking to Israel again about what he has spoken. Not kept secret, but what he has spoken in time past. The time period determined upon them and says now, today, if you hear his voice... God is not preaching this message to the nation of Israel today. God is preaching this message to Jew and Gentile alike. Out here, it's different. Now, we'll pick up. I'm going to stop the camera real quick and turn it right back on, and we'll uh, make another video real quick.